Sisters and brothers, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. At that time, the Lord appointed 72 others whom he sent ahead of him in pairs to every town and place he intended to visit. He said to them, The harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. Go on your way. Behold, I am sending you like lambs among wolves. Carry no money bag, no sack, no sandals, and greet no one along the way. Into whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this household. If a peaceful person lives there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in the same house and eat and drink what is offered to you. For the laborer deserves his payment. Do not move about from one house to another. Whatever town you enter and they welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God is at hand for you. Whatever town you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, the dust of your own town that clings to our feet, even that we shake off against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God is at hand. I tell you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom on that day then for that town. The 72 returned rejoicing and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us because of your name. Jesus said, I have observed Satan fall like lightning from the sky. Behold, I have given you the power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and upon the full force of the enemy and nothing will harm you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice because the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. When I was a novice with the Friars back in, I think, 2003, 2004, it was the practice at that time, at least with Holy Name Province, to send us during the summer to the Summer Institute School. Uh, some of you might remember the classes that used to go on when the Institute was in full force, and there were still students getting master's degrees there. And that particular summer, I took a course with Brother Bill Cook. Um, and uh, I remember really enjoying the class. I'm sorry, uh, Bill Short. <laughs> but uh, if he ever hears me call him Bill Cook, I'm in trouble. But anyway, Bill Short. And I remember one time, this, this one really stuck out to me one day. You know, we've all heard people ask that question. There was bumper stickers people wore and on their wrists, what, not, what would Jesus do? You've all heard of that. And, um, and so Bill was going on about Francis and his ministry and so forth and his teachings. And somebody raised the inevitable question when it came to how do we apply it to, 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 to today, what would Francis do? I thought it was a legitimate question to ask and I, I'd like to hear a response to that. How do we take a medieval saint and apply his ideas to our modern world? And Bill shocked us all. He kind of stared at us and they said, he wouldn't do anything, he's dead. Well then, so then he began to explain what, what he meant by that. And I have taken that with me all these years. I even used it in my book because I really liked the point he was making. And the point was, we cannot become 13th century saints living literally the teachings of Francis. And in fact, most of us uh, break one of his commandments right away. He, he told us friars not to ride horses. And yet I rode over here and a lot of horsepower. So, and that wasn't, the point was 
to take the teachings of Jesus, um, the teachings of Francis and Jesus, and take the principle from them, the principle that comes out of Francis's own context, his own history, and then how does that principle enter into our understanding of the world and how we live it and practice it. And I want to do that with the gospel today. Because a lot of times when we 21st century, and some of us born in the 20th century, read the gospels, we tend to read it like most people do, and that is from our own cultural perspective. And so we read into the scriptures rather than getting something out of the scriptures. We project our own culture, our own worldview onto the scriptures. Well, first of all, Jesus sends out 72. Now this is interesting because if you read the Hebrew Old Testament in Genesis, there was this concept that there were 70 nations and that concept was still a part of the Jewish imagination, except in the translation, the Greek translation, the Septuagint, it named 72 nations. So we know Luke was reading the Septuagint version when Jesus sends out 72. And it's probably a kind of symbol of Jesus' disciples are to go out and preach the gospel to the whole world, including non-Jews, the Gentiles. When Luke is writing this gospel, of course, he's writing it after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And he is experiencing the mission of the church. And Jesus, first he sent out his 12 apostles, and now he sends out his 72. And of course, he commands us to go out and preach the gospel. And since then, we have been a missionary religion, which we're still called to go out and preach the gospel. In fact, all of you sisters, that's probably what drew you to religious life, to preach that good news in any form you can. But I'd like to look at it within the context of Jesus' own world vision, world view, his own culture. One of the realities of the ancient world was the scarcity of things. Food, you and I, if you take a good look at me, if I turn sideways like this, you notice food is not scarce for me. And in fact, it's a little too abundant. But in most of world history, and still today in parts of the world, food is not readily available like it is to us North Americans. So that if you are either traveling or experience drought or any other kind of misfortune, you become absolutely dependent on the hospitality of the other, of someone. This became so important to the ancient world that they developed rituals around it. It became a part of their mindset. It wasn't simply, oh, you look hungry, come in and have something to eat. It actually formed rituals, rules, and regulations around hospitality. And if you read the Old Testament very closely, throughout the Old Testament, if you pay attention to the concept of hospitality, it is inundated with issues around hospitality. And I brought a cheat sheet because I, I want to, at my age, I'm starting to forget things and I need notes. But <clears throat> a few things. Remember <clears throat> the story of Abraham sitting outside his tent and he sees strangers come up and he runs to them and he bows before them. This is very much the ritual practice of hospitality, showing I want to help you. This was a great sign of taking care of the stranger. And taking care of the stranger is a major uh, reality in the Old Testament. He washes their feet, a form of, another form of ritualized hospitality, a sense that I want to take care of your bodily needs too, your dirty feet, and refresh them. And he feeds them. And in fact, this becomes almost part of the law. There is the mosaic necessity for hospitality. And so Moses reminding the Hebrews that they had been slaves and strangers in Egypt, 
And when they were to enter into the land, they were to remember they were strangers. And when strangers come into their land, they are to treat them with hospitality. And in fact, we read in Exodus, Exodus, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Exodus 23, 9. And then in Leviticus 19, 33 through 34. When a stranger sojourns within you in your land, you shall not do him harm. The stranger who sojourns with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy 10, 18. God executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. And even Paul in the New Testament tells us, or at least the letter to the Hebrews, I'm sorry. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels among you. And even in Proverbs, get this one. This, is one, this one I don't want to read, but I'm going to read it to be honest with myself, because my homily is for me today, not for you, for my own transformation. Proverbs 25, 21 through 22. If your enemy is hungry, did you catch that? If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. And Jesus himself practices hospitality the wedding of Cana, on the road to Emmaus, the guest becomes the host. And so his disciples, which is us, who spend time with the teachings of Jesus, we spend time reflecting on his life, how he behaved through the witness of the scriptures. If we don't see that the heart of the gospel message is actually hospitality. We miss it. Now, I want to break that principle open for our own day. It goes, it's a two-way street hospitality. Now, in the ancient world, to break the code of hospitality could lead to violence, conflict. If someone comes to your table and you offer you, in a sense, form a bond, a covenant with them. And if the person who is the guest breaks that bond by betraying the host, it is a great act of violence and will lead to conflict. And notice what happens. One of the greatest dramatic dramas, unfortunate realities in the New Testament. At table, Judas betrays Jesus. See, we think of it just in terms of somebody betraying us, but this was betrayal against hospitality, a very powerful force in that, in that world. It breaks down boundaries, the sharing of food, the sharing of space, the sharing of conversation. In some cases, that's how you get business too, patrons and clients. And so Jesus teaches us that the kingdom of God is about hospitality. And if you don't think so, remember he says this, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you also may be. Hospitality into his home. And he says at the Last Supper, I will not eat of this again until the banquet of heaven. Heaven is just one big banquet of hospitality. It's the breakdown of the barriers between our human relationships. But like I said, it's a two-way street. Notice what Jesus commands of the 72. When you go, don't take anything with you, a purse or shoes or anything, because these things are symbolic, money, power. 
choose protection and security to the fragility of our feet. When you approach someone with total defenselessness, it is up to them to reach out for hospitality, to give hospitality. And in that world, to reject a person is to break a huge code. And that code really is the sign and symbol of the kingdom of God. Now, <clears throat> why I said this is about me. There are people I don't want sitting with me at table. All you have to do is follow my Facebook page. I can be incredibly critical and judgmental. And there are a lot of people on there I just can't see me sitting and sharing a pizza with. Definitely ain't washing their feet. And I, it might sound humorous, but that's a real indictment against me. And I, I don't think I'm alone. To not go and speak to anybody on the way, but get there. I was listening to James Allison give his weekly reflection on this, on the Gospels <clears throat> for each Mass. And he talked about if we come across somebody on the road, we might listen to their gossip about where we're going. Oh, I don't know. Um, Olean, Allegheny. Oh, those are terrible towns. They're so small. And the people there, they just gossip all the time. Blah, 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 blah. Well, I don't think I'll go to Olean. Or I will come with preconceived ideas about the person. I have to be free from presumptions. Regardless of who you are, what you believe, your ideology, your belief system, my job as a disciple of Jesus Christ is to be open to fellowship. And, and notice what happens. Now I have friends, I've, especially one friend, who I really like. I really like him. But we don't agree on theology at, almost at all. But it never stops us from enjoying each other's company. You know why? Because we like each other, regardless of our ideology. We accept each other. We're to free ourselves from those ideologies and those boundaries within us that keeps us from being able to share hospitality, to receive it, and to give it. That's really what our life is about. It's not about going and trying to convert people to our ideas. I thought that was for many years. Nobody has ever converted to my way of thinking in my argumentative moments. I've never converted anybody on Twitter as much as I have tried. What changes people is when we open our hearts to the other, to see their humanity and to care for it, to wash their feet, to feed them, regardless of whether they ever come to accept our beliefs, our way of life. The kingdom is about hospitality.